Okay, good evening everyone. We'll call to order the Police Accountability Board and Administrative Charging Committee uh, this day, July 13th, 2022. Right. Mr. Cromwell, thank you for calling us into order. Uh, welcome everybody to the first meeting of the St. Mary's County Police Accountability Board and Administrative Charging Committee. As you all know, purpose of tonight is going to be a bit of an orientation. Um, going through the, the niceties and what it means to be a board or a commission of St. Mary's County, how it is going to work, and a few housekeeping and business matters uh, related to the election of officers, the adoption of bylaws, and the adoption of a schedule of meetings for the Police Accountability Board at the night. Um, I'll be right up front, it will be a bit of a lengthier meeting than normal, I think. There is, as you all have seen from materials submitted beforehand, there is a good a bit of ground to cover. I will try to be as efficient and quick and respectful of your all's time as possible in covering that. Hope we won't take too, too long. Uh, do not, though, let that discourage anyone from asking a question. If anything I say is not clear, if there's something I leave unsaid, if there's anything you all do wonder about, feel free at any moment to butt in, arrest my attention, or however you might, and we'll take care of it in the moment rather than wait for questions at the end. I could probably be best to take them up as they come up. Uh, before we roll into the agenda, um, introductions for those of us in the room, I think it'd probably be a good idea to have every member of the Police Accountability Board Administrative Charging Committee introduce themselves, state first and last name, and just arbitrarily ask if we can start from the far corner, Mr. Wild, and we can just go sequentially across the dais from there. My name is Pete Wild. I'm Joe Van Kirk. Michelle Dowling. Frank Kaufman. Leslie Everett. Nick Cromwell. Tom Phelan. John Lydon. Chuck Schilling. Lieutenant Clay Safford, representative from the Sheriff's Office. And my name is John Hauser. I'm the Assistant County Attorney in the St. Mary's County Attorney's Office. The other staff we have in attendance tonight are also from the County Attorney's Office. Assistant Diane Gleisner, who is at the computer working as administrative support this evening. Next to her is not a member of the Office of the County Attorney yet, but will be starting July 24th, Jillian Bacon, who will be the administrative support going forward. And um, as soon as she feels comfortable and Ms. Gleisner feels all right letting the reins go to Ms. Bacon. With us in the media room is Amy Carter, our video media producer. Uh, for the benefit of those of us who may be watching at home or who may be watching this in posterity, all the members present tonight are members of the Police Accountability Board with the exception of Mr. Wild, who is a member of the Administrative Charging Committee, and uh, with a mention to Chairman Cromwell, who is a member of both the Police Accountability Board and Administrative Charging Committee. Uh, not with us tonight is Dr. Linda Limas, who is also a member of both the Police Accountability Board and Administrative Charging Committee. Dr. Limas had a pre-existing obligation tonight when uh, once this board was formed and we over in staff unilaterally said this would be the date of our first meeting, there was an obligation that could but not be moved, but she um, sends her regrets and wishes she could be here. Our first order of business that will require a motion and action by the board is a review of the proposed agenda for tonight and then a motion uh, adopting that agenda, followed by hopefully a second and a positive vote in favor to go forward with the agenda. The agenda is after the first tab on the a material on the binder that has been given to each one of you. That's very simple. We've got four business items, the orientation from the Office of the County Attorney, and then election of officers, adoption of bylaws, adoption of meeting schedules. There will be time between the end of that last item of new business and adjournment to partake in any discussion or other items of new business any member of the board might want to bring up. But uh, what we would begin, every board in St. Mary's County would at this time, we would have one member it could be the chair, though typically would not be the chair, move to approve the agenda. We would then ask for a second. If there'd be any discussion, if there is any, a board member could call for it. If there is no discussion, then we could move to a vote. And I would um, solicit a motion to approve the agenda uh, from a member of the board at this time. I move to approve the agenda. I right. second it. We have a- uh, Motion carried. Uh, we can- uh, I suppose we won't do a roll call vote. Any nays to moving forward with the agenda? All right, 
right, not hearing any, the motion carries. I also say now, I forgot, because Dr. Limas is not here, we only have two members of the Administrative Charging Committee present. That means we do not have a quorum. I'll touch on more about what that means and what we can do with the ACC tonight. Uh, the long and short of it means that we cannot have the election of a chairman or the adoption of a schedule by the ACC tonight. Um, I will say more about this later. It, might have been the more prudential decision to put off those two action items later anyways, once we have a fully staffed ACC, but I will touch on that later. First item of the approved agenda then is the orientation of the county attorney. And how this will work is that I'm going to sequentially work through each of the remaining 18 documents that are in your orientation binder. It sounds intimidating. I'm gonna do some of these together, some of these in very broad strokes. Uh, I do apologize, it will be a little long, but we're just gonna do the best of it we can. The first few documents that you have in here are the resolution the St. Mary's County Commissioners adopted, uh, establishing the PAB and ACC, and then uh, taken kind of as part of this is the additional background on the PAB and ACC, the legislation that gave us those, and then also the state regulations that came down at the end of June further defining these. As Members likely know and recall the St. Mary's County Police and Accountability Board and Administrative Charging Committee were formed pursuant to requirements of state law. Last year in 2021, the Maryland General Assembly uh, passed that year's House Bill 670, which repealed in large part the existing Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights and replaced it with a new system that the General Assembly hoped and believed will give civilians more oversight and control of discipline of law enforcement officers. Uh, the county's Police Accountability Board and Administrative Charging committee are both components of that new system and as uh, you all likely recall each county in Maryland and the city of Baltimore was required to implement a local version of a police accountability board and administrative charging committee by July 1st of this year uh, the police accountability board consists of eight members and a chairperson all appointed by the commissioners of St. Mary's County additionally we have an ex officio designee a non-voting ex officio designee from the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Department. That ex officio designee tonight is Lieutenant Clay Safford. My understanding is that Lieutenant Safford will probably be passing off that weighty responsibility with other members of the department over these meetings. So we may see that member shift from time to time, but the Sheriff's Office will always have the right to name an ex officio member of this board. Uh, the Police Accountability Board has five statuto statutory duties. The first is to hold quarterly meetings with heads of local law enforcement agencies to work with those agencies and county government to improve matters of policing in St. Mary's County. The second is to appoint civilian members to the St. Mary's County Administrative Charging Committee and any trial boards which may have to be formed from time to time. Third duty is to receive complaints of police misconduct filed by members of the public Public. The fourth is to periodically review outcomes of disciplinary matters considered by our local charging committee. And the fifth and final statutory duty is to submit an annual report to the county commissioners identifying any trends in, dis in the disciplinary process of local law enforcement officers over the past year and to make recommendations on policy that would improve police accountability in St. Mary's County. The Police Accountability Board itself does not investigate allegations of police misconduct. It receives complaints and within three days by law, those complaints are forwarded to our local law enforcement agency. The local law enforcement agency then conducts its own investigation, and that investigation file, once completed, and it must be turned to, finished within a year and one day of a complaint being received, the administrative charging committee then reviews the investigation file and makes a determination whether or not they recommend a discipline of the law enforcement officer in question. John, quick question. Uh, does the does the local law enforcement agency include the state police barracks no. here in St. Mary's County? The local law, for the purposes of receiving a complaint of police misconduct, it does not include the Maryland State Police. They are subject to a state, um, state level administrative charging committee. The only local law enforcement agency that discipline matters are going to come before the ACC on will be our local sheriff's department. It's Thank you. likely and we're hoping that we will at least for that first duty of having quarterly meetings with local law enforcement agencies to 
uh, work with us and improve on matters of local policing that Maryland State Police might deign to visit us from time to time, although we don't have authority, we don't have jurisdiction to force them in front of either the PAB or the ACC if they choose not to. The hope would be that it certainly would probably be beneficial for all involved if they would, but the jurisdiction of St. Mary's County and its PAB and ACC extends only to our local sheriff's department. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, as I touched upon, the Administrative Charge Committee's prime, only really statutory duty is to review those investigation files that are compiled and finished by local law enforcement and then turned over to review. The Administrative Charge Committee consists of five members. Three of those members are appointed by the commissioners and the remaining two will be appointed by the Police Accountability Board. Those five members will then elect a chairperson from among their number. As mentioned, the ACC reviews complaints of police misconduct upon the completion of an investigation of police misconduct by a local law enforcement agency, the ACC must then determine whether or not the officer in question ought to be administratively charged. Uh, if the ACC recommends discipline be administered, it must then also recommend what discipline should be applied, and that must be commensurate with the guidelines given by the statewide uniform disciplinary matrix, a copy of which is included for your benefit and your edification in the orientation materials. Uh, the range prescribed within the disciplinary matrix may not be deviated from by the Administrative Charging Committee in recommending sanctions. Uh, the sanctions recommended by the Administrative Charging Committee we call them recommendations. They are recommendations to the local law enforcement agency. They are recommendations with the asterisk, though, the local law, the head of the local law enforcement agency may not deviate below those recommendations. If the law enforcement agency's head, if our sheriff rejects the recommendation, it can only be to administer harsher discipline than what was offered or recommended by the administrative charging committee. So the ACC effectively sets a floor as to what discipline will be in cases it reviews. Uh, the ACC is required to maintain confidentiality of their investigations and their review of materials until final disposition of a case. Uh, most likely what will be happening for the ACC is required to meet monthly. When we do have a case that will be reviewed, the most likely process we will follow is as a public body, it is required to open up a meeting as we just did now. There will then almost immediately be a motion to enter into closed session. And those five members will then deliberate in private and review, conduct the review in closed session where confidentiality can be maintained, likely in the conference room uh, behind the door in the back there. Uh, once the review is finished for that night, we'll leave closed session, come back out, and close out the meeting in open session. Uh, confidentiality ends at the upon final disposition of the case, when the ACC is required to issue a written opinion at the end of its review detailing its facts and findings and its recommendations to make in a case. A copy of that written determination is then sent to the sheriff, the law officer in question, and the complainant in the case in question. Among, so all of the about last few minutes of talking cover roughly items two through 11 of the orientation materials you got. Obviously there is a couple hundred, a little bit over a hundred pages of materials, there, especially when you count in the entirety of House Bill 670, which you may feel free to disregard, but in my heart I thought I was honor bound to put in front of you. Uh, what the purpose of that was, was, a perp was to give you an overview and a reminder of the Police Accountability Board and the Administrative Charging Committee, and in broad strokes what its functions are and how this process will work, and what the expectations of each body are. If there are questions about any more particular duties or how that would work on the ACC or the PAB itself, probably now would be the better time to ask them. The remainder of the orientation meetings are going to be more housekeeping matters related to boards and commissions of St. Mary's County in general. The ethics ordinance, open meetings requirements, uh, the reminder of how public information requests will act if anybody seeks uh, through a Maryland Public Information Act request, information or products of this board or the Administrative Charging Committee. And then at the very end, talking about the few business items we have on the list, that being election of officers, adoption of bylaws for the PAB, and adopting a meeting schedule. Any questions on the... Yes, John, <clears throat> I think I heard you say that uh, 
we'll have the PAB and then um, if there's a need to have the ACC, we'll break off from that point. So are their meetings gonna be together or not? No. no, this will be probably the next meet and will also be a joint meeting of the PAB. But from that point on, the idea was because there are very common processes and facts to both, the idea was to begin this off with a joint meeting. But the idea going forward is once we really hit the ground and these are up and running, is that the PAB and the ACC will have a separate meeting schedule. PAB is not supposed to take an active role in the ACC's deliberations. It's not supposed to have oversight or control over the ACC's review, except in so far as it can name two of the ACC's members. The PAB's interaction with the ACC beyond that initial appointment is that the Police Accountability Board, again, will periodically review the disciplinary outcomes of reviews, and that review does not mean a repeal, it does not mean revising the sanctions or the findings of the ACC, it simply means reviewing them. And then also the Police Accountability Board has the right to recall its two appointees to the Administrative Charging Committee. Uh, beyond that, the Administrative Charging Committee will work independently of the Police Accountability Board. The Police Accountability Board will also have a right, and I'll touch upon this more at the Open Meetings Act, to go into closed session from time to time, but it's, at least as I perceive, the Police Accountability Board most, if not all, of its sessions will be conducted in open meetings with public access available, as we would have tonight if there were any members of the public here. That answers yes. the question. All right, the uh, question I have is, we have the, the statewide police disciplinary matrix, which is in the booklet and I've already taken a look at. Does the Sheriff's Department have something similar to this that they're gonna be using, creating, or are we gonna be just working off of what the state has? So my understanding, and I will punt to <clears throat> Lieutenant Safford here in a moment, but my understanding is that this disciplinary matrix is intended Statewide. for complaints of police misconduct that right. would be off the Administrative Charging Committee. Statewide, every ACC in every county in the city of Baltimore will go by this, and the prescriptions and the sanctions offered will all be in accord with this one document. There won't be local flavors on that. My understanding is that disciplinary matrix was also intended and will cover internal discipline as well. Yes, as of July 1st, we've adopted, adopted this matrix for all complaints, whether it comes to the PAB or ACC, or if it stays internal in our agency, we, we're gonna use the same matrix for everything. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. John, I have a question, please. Um, looking at the at the bylaws and that was provide that were provided to us with the draft and the article article two the purpose of the body as it says here the purpose of the body is to forward complaints of police m misconduct to the appropriate law enforcement agency. My question is twofold: one, how do we how are those complaints going to come to us, and how and why would they come to us? Under what circumstances? Well, they're coming to you because that is what the law says. And in this sense, it's not correct to say that the Police Accountability Board is only a clearinghouse for receipt of complaints because you do have that right and that duty to review the disciplinary outcomes. But at the genesis of a case, when a complaint is issued, the only ability or authority the Police Accountability Board has at that moment in time for that particular complaint is to forward it on to local law enforcement agency. How we are doing that in process. We've set up an e Email that is available on St. Mary's County's website, on the Police Accountability Board's website. Uh, it is pab at stmarysmd.com. That is acting as our receptacle for these emails. How it is set up is that once that email receives a any activity whatsoever, a copy is automatically forwarded to my email, Ms. Gleisner's email, and soon Ms. Bacon's email. And then we will be automatically at that point forwarding on to Mr. to Lieutenant Safford or his designee at the Sheriff's Department. So staff is acting as uh, if the Police Accountability Board would agree and. Um, go along with this, our thought was that staff could act as the intermediary for the Police Accountability Board to receive those complaints, make sure someone is monitoring that inbox, and then promptly forwarding those on to meet our statutory requirement to forward them to the, the Sheriff's Department within three days of receipt. And a copy to each of the members on the PAB? So. Because confidentiality is required, and that is also required of the members of the Police Accountability Board, 
the thought was is that I think it would be proper to be notified that a complaint has been received and perhaps in very broad strokes what that complaint is about. I don't know if at that stage it would be beneficial or necessary for the Police Accountability Board to get the identities of those involved. Ultimately, it's your board, it's your decision, but I think we would fit the legal requirements and best maintain confidentiality until final disposition of the matter if staff would act as the receiver and sender of those complaints. So, John, just to make clear on this, um, so when these complaints, should they come to our attention, mm -hmm. uh, what criteria do we apply to look at the complaint and make a determination as to whether it in fact should be forwarded? I mean, what, what would be the nature of those complaints? Is there an established criteria for what we, I read them, looked at the matrix, thing and uh, I'm try, trying to decide, trying to determine someone would make a complaint to us about a, a police officer stepping on their foot. Now, I'm being facetious with, with, with regard to the type of complaint that that could be, but I mean, it, do we have a criteria? Do we have something that will determine what it takes for us to forward that on to the sheriff's office? You do. Police misconduct was defined both in HB 670 and Maryland statute, and then that definition repeated within Comar. And that definition is, I believe, in the Comar 12.04.09. In its definitions, it may, if not there, there's a general section of Comar for other definitions that wasn't among the materials provided that we get you to. Um, there are four criteria for that have to be satisfied for it to be police misconduct. And the idea is both that it has to be, among other things, the police officer has to have a violation of a written policy. He has to be performing a crime or other unlawful act. There has to be a deprivation of a constitutional right. And the way in practice that sorting through this is going to work, or I would advise any commission member or board member who might receive or be made aware of a conduct complaint of police misconduct on their own, is to forward it to myself or another member of staff. We are forwarding everything we receive regardless of content or what we think of it personally over to the law enforcement agency for them to perform the review on their own. Because the law enforcement agency is going to <coughs> my office, for example, what if any policy of the local sheriff's department was violated. The local law enforcement agency then is going to be kind of the sieve that these are going to pass through, subject again to us knowing what the complaints were and if we're not seeing action upon a complaint or have a question about it, we can follow up on things and say, what is the status of this? Are you moving forward on it? And if not, why not? But we're not gonna delve into the nature of the complaint. I would think the Police Accountability Board at this stage again, because of the statute and Comar's requirements to maintain confidentiality and the idea that the Administrative Charter Committee is the body that receives, that has the direct and the primary oversight over the review and the administration of discipline for those complaints has more an ACC function than a PAB function. Could you enumerate a little bit about the mechanism for how a citizen goes about following play? Will it be a dual access point? They'll be able to go to the police agency and the, the uh, your office? Yes, you can forward either with the law enforcement agency yourself or the office. And um, it might be helpful at this point if you could navigate to the web page and I can show what this looks like. And while they're pulling that up, we actually have an online portal as well for complaint process. It's called the Public Portal, which is available on our homepage for the Sheriff's Office. And that's how citizens file complaints now with us. So it's, uh, we'll have our process, you'll have your process. And It, it seems to me that at, at the very minimum, we should have some sort of case tracking system when a report is filed and it goes over to the Sheriff's Department, we need to make sure that we're getting told whether the case was valid or whether the case needs to be further investigated. So, so it doesn't drop off our radar. That so, would make sense to me. So not what? necessarily every case will come to us, but we will be informed that there was a complaint. Yeah, I, I, I take this board to be overseeing all of those actions and 
to be able to do that in a responsible manner, we need to know about all. So what we will be doing, we will be maintaining a database in our office, complaints received, tracked, what their status of, what our drop dead, you know, that year and one day that we have to have final disposition of the case will be. What would probably be the easiest way is just every time the Police Accountability Board meets, either send you out periodic updates of that chart where it is, or at the every meeting have a moment where I give an update on what, if any, complaints have been received in the interim, where we stand with each, any questions about them. Yep, that um, seems acceptable to me. Diane, if you could open up the complaint form there. But so where we're at right now, um, or to say that, where we were just at was the St. Mary's County website. And, and could you go up to the menu for public agencies and just get the drop down? <clears throat> and you'll see among our public agencies now is Police Accountability Board. There it is. Yep, the bottom left. Left. Uh, left. Yep. Right, I was... Yep. Okay. No and so if you click on that, it'll take you to this page. And there's, at a nutshell, the public information on the PAB. We'll have, I also created a flow chart for members of the public just to show how a complaint process works from submission to review by to the ACC to the end of the most long and convoluted the process can become an appeal from a trial board decision to circuit court. Uh, that flow chart just there for public information. The other things you have there are the contact us, which will take us to the PAB at stmarysmd.com email. And then at the bottom is a, and then between there, agendas, minutes, and schedules for all our meetings. And at the end will be a complaint form. And it's just something that it's a PDF, someone can download, fill out themselves, hit save, send to us by email, it contains all the information that by law, a complaint of police misconduct needs to have for us to be able to act upon it. A description of the alleged misconduct, a name or at least good, credible contact follow-up information for the complainant or the person making the complaint on the victim's behalf, and then also an identification of the officer whom they suspect to be the cause of the misconduct, with instructions at the bottom that this should be emailed to PAB at stmarysmd.com, and a reminder that this has to be adjudicated or disposed of in full within one year and one day of the moment they press send or otherwise deliver that email. That's the process we have sketched out for now. I have, a, I have a question for you. It seems as if there's two collection points. So my my question is about cross pollination. If the police department, if the sheriff's department is is collecting complaints at their end, will they then be required to list and provide details so that you can track both points of collection? That is not specified in the in the statute as and far I was as that just process thinking the goes. Same thing. And here's the other, the reality of the fun process we are about to embark upon together. Every police accountability board and administrative charging committee statewide is going through this for the first time. There's going to be a lot of trial and error and a lot of watching the successes and the mistakes and the triumphs and the <coughs> boneheaded moments of other jurisdictions and our own as well. So there are gonna be refinements to this process. And I would expect in the next five months, you will start seeing some of this and some best practices emerging. And I would be personally shocked if come the start of the next session in January for the legislature, there aren't refinements made to this in law as well that we're just gonna have to stay on top of. My gut reaction on how it is right now, again, probably pending reaching out and you know exactly what is out there. My thinking is that if it's a complaint involving a member of the public, even if it's first turned in to the sheriff's department, I, I would think because it's a member of the public that would have to wind up to the ACC. The tracking that the ACC uses to make sure that we hit one year and one day, we probably ought to be made and should be made aware of that so we can keep monitoring it as well. There's but a sec the second reason for that suggestion, since you have two collection points, is that one of the fundamental jobs of the, uh, you know, of our PAB is to uh, systematic, and particularly at the end of the year, to write a report and evaluation. If we're not cognizant of the volume of complaints and the type of complaints because of the two collection points, it'll be very difficult for us to, to satisfy that that responsibility. Right. Yeah. And the other Agreed. thing that um, that dovetails into that is the PAB's right and the duty to review the outcomes of disciplinary processes. So you would at least at the end of the process, however it goes, whether the complaint is 
drop because it doesn't meet the criteria of police misconduct, where the ACC determines there shouldn't be an officer administratively charged as a result, whether there is a decision to administratively charge and discipline sanctioned if the officer appeals or doesn't. All of that, the metrics are going to have to be put in front of the Police Accountability Board at some point so it can conduct that review of disciplinary outcomes. The report also is probably going to be a little more far-reaching than just trends in disciplinary process, considering it's that second prong of the duty to also recommend policy changes to improve matters of policing, which is, a, my opinion, more expansive than just looking at discipline of law enforcement officers and could touch upon other aspects of the Sheriff's Department's operations and how to improve the community and the police sheriff department's relations with one another. Uh, I would I would move that we have at least uh, the officer's information, the, the name, um, even if they're constantly dismissed, because if, if, if one officer, not that I believe this is going to happen, if one officer is repeatedly being reported for stuff, but yet gets dismissed, then that's a trend in itself. All right. What I will do then is I will, um, again, I, I think we are one of the later counties to have our meeting in the middle of July rather than at the beginning. What I will do in the preceding time between now and our next meeting, be that I'll talk about the meeting schedule later. I will reach out and see what other jurisdictions are doing and if there has been clarity on exactly what is going to make it out of the confidential and closed review by the Administrative Charging Committee and make it to the Police Accountability Board. What, if any, redactions there are going to be on that information and if there's any sort of clarity or decision that's been arrived at at the state level on that. For now, it's just not something that's explicitly defined or has been put into practice and challenged one way or the other yet. And that guidance is going to come out of the state's attorney's office, or oh, we—that guidance <coughs> might not even exist. Uh, well, month, if it comes, a month. Uh, I will say, if anybody, I will probably speak a little more frankly than times than perhaps I should have. <laughs> um, exactly how much <laughs> guidance and help we've gotten from the state through this whole process, <laughs> uh, it very may well be that we are not going to have the answer or a clear answer when I come back, that it just doesn't exist, and we're just going to have to come up with the best in our own, reaching around in the dark, and it'll probably be a discussion to sit down and Yeah, whether it becomes a policy or not, I mean, we, as a board, we're gonna implement procedures and, and uh, guidelines in guidelines in, and uh, in concert with the Sheriff's Department um, to make sure that uh, you know, the purpose of the board is executed, our, our goals. Um, and I, I, know, I know Tim well, so I know that he's gonna be open kimono on all this stuff. Um, I don't it, have it, any, it, any problem. Yeah, if I may. What makes this difficult is the statute, <coughs> everything we're talking about tonight, the statute specifically applies to the definition of police misconduct, which is very specific, which Mr. Hauser already discussed. It has each complaint an allegation has to fit each one of those three elements. Violation of constitutional rights, violation of criminal statute, and violation of policy procedure. And ob obviously policy procedure will go hand in hand with any of the other two. That is what comes before the PA, the ACC. Any other allegations or complaints, they stay internally and they never come over here per the statute. So that's kind of what we're working through. Uh, just for example, last year we had 95 investigations, internal investigations with the Sheriff's Office, and out of those 95, I'd say a handful, I haven't counted them yet, but maybe just a handful would have qualified for the ACC. Kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at. Does that make sense? So yeah. how we're going to work through that, I mean, we're, like you said, the Sheriff wants to be as transparent as, transparent as possible. And uh, I can also say this, as of last October 1st, you can get all that information you're asking for. It's Public Information Act requests. You can ask for spreadsheets, and it comes with names and everything now. So, so I have a question. If yes, the um, complainant does not fill out their information, but they're still the incident is reported and is violated, what process will you still investigate it? If there's no, the complainant just sent it in without information. Right. If it qualifies for police misconduct, the allegation. Right, qualifies, then they, by law, they have to provide their name and identifying information. Yes, ma'am. I think perhaps maybe if I'm reading the gist of the question well, what would Lieutenant Safford the process be if, say, a complaint is issued that is anonymous, that doesn't meet the definition of putting in front of the administrative charging committee because they don't give us reliable 
contact information for a follow-up investigation, which again, by statute, would take it out of our purview, but what, if any, action would the department take on its own, unilaterally, if any? Right, so currently, we accept anonymous complaints currently. Okay. Now, we're working through this because the statute specifically uh, states that the information must be provided, so we're working through that in-house in right now on how to proceed. And like Mr. Hauser already indicated, it's, there's, there's a lot of moving parts with a lot of these laws, and specifically this one, so. Mr. Hausner, do you anticipate the public having the opportunity to come and address this board, PAB, from time to time? And if so, what are we going to do to educate the citizens of the county to avail them of their opportunities? So the second question is, um, it's the easier one to answer, so I'll take that one up first. And that is whatever this board decides. The Police Accountability Board, you are the members on it. You decide what to do. If you say the agenda for the next meeting in August will be we want to put out a press release that says members of the public come here, we are going to talk you through this process, I do what you tell me to do so long as it's legal. And even then, the question might be depending on what it is. We'll see. But. The first question, though, as far as a member of the public's right to come here, is these, the Police Accountability Board's meetings are going to be open to the public. Anybody who wanted to come here right now would have the right to walk through those doors, take a seat. They wouldn't have the right to speak and come up and address and command, take floor of the agenda and put something in front of you unless the Police Accountability Board wanted to. But these meetings are open access. Member of the public can come in. This will be, it's going live on YouTube right now, will be there for all posterity. Minutes will be made public. Uh, the PA AB at stmarysmd.com email also works as general contact. Just doesn't have to be um, complaint driven. If we receive a request for information, if we receive contact on that one, again, unless it's truly just obviously spam and has no material value whatsoever, but if it is an actual communication from a constituent to the Police Accountability Board, that was similar to how an email to the commissioners of St. Mary's County Public Email work, that would be forwarded to each and every one of you to see. So the Police Accountability Board can, I guess to sum that one up, it can do as much public outreach as it would like, just again within our human limits of what resources we have available in times of resources and talent and ability and uh, funds, but uh, the public's right to come up and speak, they will be allowed to attend if the commission, if the Police Accountability Board wanted to, for example, give a night that was entirely over to a public forum or to invite folks to come up and have their moment to speak and say whatever's on their mind, we completely within the realm of the Police Accountability Board to do. Thank you. So, Mr. Hauser, you said uh, confidentiality several times. Where is that line between confidentiality and open to the public? I mean, do we have closed sessions to deal with certain matters or? It's a good question. The quick answer to closed session is yes. And I'll touch upon that a little bit more when we get down to the Open Meetings Act. But both of these bodies have the ability to go into closed session for circumstances and uh, discussions that qualify for closed session. My inkling is that very much, if not all, of what the Administrative Charging Committee will qualify for closed session, okay. and there is more or less a legal requirement that it be done in closed session in a place where it can be done confidential. Police Accountability Board, on the other hand, probably its bread and butter, very less likely to be able to credibly claim the right to go into closed session on. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Van Kirk. John, um how would our agenda be set? Would the members send things we thought was pertinent to the chairman? Or would we have to discuss it as an open meeting? You know, for the next meeting, if someone thought of, oh, we should talk about this, do we send it to staff? I would think probably the way and how it works on other committees is that our agenda has to be published 24 hours in advance. So obviously, that gives us a lot of time and a lot of a window to add stuff to it. I think if something comes up that wants to be discussed, the most prudential way to go about, in my opinion, would be either to communicate that with uh, myself or the chairman. If it's to me, I will then communicate with the chairman. If he thinks it's appropriate to bring up on the agenda, I'll just go ahead and add it on there as a matter of course, no questions asked. If Mr. Cromwell, whatever reason, and does not want to talk about what you want to talk about that evening, then it would be open for you at the meeting to make a motion to place this on the agenda, to reject the agenda that's offered at the meeting and insert or modify it however you would like. But I do not think it's gonna be overly formulaic or uh, too burdensome a process to talk about whatever might be of interest to you all. Okay. 
Uh, that's for the PAB, I will say. The Administrative Charging Committee, weird artifact of what's come out of after Comar, is that it says that it's the duty of the chairman of the Administrative Charging Committee to set the agenda of the ACC. So take that for what it is. The um, one saving grace we have on that one is that the ACC does have much less of a portfolio and a much more restricted and narrow focus than the Police Accountability Board, being that the ACC is just there to review completed investigations of alleged police misconduct and that's it. And either it has one of those to review in a given night or it does not. Any other questions of general interest or general applicability to either the structure or the purpose or the activities of the Police Accountability Board or Administrative Charging Committee? Mr. Van Kirk. One more quick question. Um, I've seen our agenda, of course, for tonight. Will the board tonight decide on the other two members of the ACC? I will touch on that. The only okay. thing we can do to, well, I can go ahead and say it right now. It's not too much, and when it's said, it doesn't make a difference. The, um, it, there are pros and cons to, I suppose, having a lawyer be the primary uh, support staff on this one. And this might be a pro or a con, but um, the way the Comar regulation is written for appointing those two other members of the Administrative Charging Committee is that the appointing body must issue or publicly invite applications for 30 days before they can fill that vacancy. That's what it says. Now, and again, freely concede that it is perhaps a more legalistic definition than what a common sense might tell you, but I will fight for this one. The appointing body of the three current members of the Administrative Charging Committee were the county commissioners. No question about it, they were the ones with the right to make the call. For these remaining two, it's the Police Accountability Board. We have not met yet. This is our first meeting. There has been no ability for the Police Accountability Board to take an action on its own. The solicitation of applications that went out, the public invitation that was already made, was made by the commissioners, and that is not the appointing body for these two remaining spots. So the way I look at this and where I think we are forced to go on it is for tonight, the Police Accountability Board to publicly and make a motion to publicly invite applications to the two remaining vacancies on the ACC for at least the the next 30 days to direct staff to issue a press release and to collect applications we receive on your behalf. And then once those 30 days are up, we can have a meeting and then decide how we go about acting upon the applications that were received. That I think is the path that has been foisted upon us by the Comar regulation that came down. John, is it also kind of unsaid that the way they the way it was structured in the House bill down to giving the authoritative body of the, in our case, the commissioners to choose three. I'm assuming, reading between the lines, they did not want the other two members to come from the PAB. I mean, it doesn't say that, I don't think, in anything I've read, but... It, it doesn't say that. I have no indication of that either. I mean, I can certainly see a prudential argument both ways on that one, that on the one hand, members of the Police Accountability Board would have experience with it. It would make that ability to review outcomes of disciplinary measures a little bit easier. On the other hand, I can obviously see and concede an argument that perhaps you do want to spread the decision making out as much as possible. Now, what I will say is that the state did explicitly provide and require that the um, at least one member of the Police Accountability Board serve on the Administrative Charging Committee, that in all circumstances there has to be at least one. They made that specification without limiting it. So I, I do not see where we've been told that it can't. I think that is another thing where the General Assembly, knowing that this is a first thing and you are going to have a lot of experiential, experimental approaches across the county or state and that you are going to have 24 jurisdictions with 24 different structures, that there's probably some room to try some different things out and see if it works, see if it doesn't. And that might be a clarification that's forthcoming. So uh, there's no clear answer on it one way or the other. Um, but that also means there is nothing saying that it, we can't do it either. And it was ultimately left up 
to uh, the counties to implement these boards as they see fit within the guidelines that were given. So I was just asking the question so that when we ask to submit applications, if that's what the chairman chooses to, to do, that when it comes back next time, the board would know that we can choose from them or we can choose from here. Right, but I would okay. see that it, um, again, obviously we have members already on the ACC who are serving on both boards. Um, we've got Mr. Uh, Cromwell and we have Dr. Limas. Obviously the county commissioners see okay with my office sees that it's okay. It's a little bit of an unsettled question, but there are going to be many unsettled questions in this process. Uh, if it comes that 30 days from now that this board, for whatever it decides, wants to choose from its own number. If those are the applications it receives and wants to act upon, I'm not going to oppose that or advise you that it would be improper. I'll talk to you about possible reservations and what people might say about it, but my ultimate recommendation would not be that you can't do it or that the General Assembly has told us it can't or ought not be done. Well, one more and then I'll, would the applications be something that the board would look at in closed session or would that be done in that's going to be, so one of the things we can go into closed session for is for personnel matters. And as the county commissioners themselves did, that would include an application. So in my opinion, it would be proper if the board wanted and if the majority of the board felt that way to consider that in closed session and then come back on to open session and announce the applications or the appointments, not the applications. But in any event, no matter if we get public applications or not, we can choose any two members that we so right you can choose any two a, subject subject to the eligibility criteria that the county commissioners passed down in their resolution which is not terribly onerous it's going to be up to you whether um you could sub generate your own application my advice probably would just be to use the same process that the county commissioners did in soliciting uh, applications for your two picks, which is they can apply through the portal on the county website. That's the same application that every member here did and submit them to the same background check the Let's push the easy that button. went through there. That's within your discretion though. That'd be my uh, Okay. All right. Moving on to the fun stuff then. The get back to where I was in place. Pardon me. The St. Mary's County in Maryland Open Meetings Acts. So these are, this is the transition to rules that will um, apply to every, every board, every public body in St. Mary's County and to some extent the state of Maryland. Uh, Police Accountability Board and Administrative Charge Committee are both public bodies under the definitions uh, provided in these Open Meetings Acts. Uh, explicitly so, it was the administrative charging committee was explicitly uh, named that in the Comar regulations that came down. They did that just so they could then turn right around and say consequently they have the same entitlement to go into closed session as any other public body under these acts. But there's no question that the general laws of the Open Meetings Acts apply to these two boards. So what that means in practical terms is when we think about the Open Meetings Acts in general, the um, phrase that you sometimes hear brandied about in both general discussions of transparency and public access to information, uh, that these are examples of sunshine laws, laws that are meant because there's an idea in public policy that the public's business should best be conducted out in the open light of day where the public can see it. As I said, we've got two, two variations, uh, two Open Meetings Acts to concern us with here. One is the St. Mary's County Open Meetings Act, which is found in Ch uh, Section 9-501, et cetera, of the Local Government Article of the Annotated Code, and the State Open Meetings Acts, which is in Section 3101, et cetera, of the General Provisions Article of the Maryland Annotated Code. I have got copies of both Meetings Acts in the orientation materials at items number 12, and number 13. Uh, St. Mary's County Open Meetings Act was enacted in 1976. It's a bit of a point of county pride among some sectors of this building <laughs> uh, because we beat the state 
Meetings, Open Meetings Act by one year when it was enacted in 1977. St. Mary's County is the only jurisdiction, the only county in Maryland that has its own Open Meetings Act with its own set of separate requirements. Every other county in Maryland just goes by the Maryland Open Meetings Acts in general. Uh, what you have, the situation that develops when you have two, a state law and a local law that overlap, is that the more restrictive of the two is going to be what controls. And St. Mary's County's Open Meetings Act is in most circumstances more restrictive than the state. So it is going to apply in most, if not every circumstance this comes up. So if you only choose one of these to have to read and study, uh, choose our local Open Meetings Act. <coughs> the um, short requirements is that all meetings of a public body must be open to the public and notice given beforehand that a meeting is to take place. At a minimum, an agenda has to be published 24 hours in advance of a regular meeting and 48 hours in advance of a special meeting. Uh, regular meetings are those that are what we will adopt later on. We adopt our regular course of meetings. Special meetings are those that can be called from time to time to take care of other business or when uh, there's more business that could be taken up then can be taken up in one regular meeting. But the actual definition of a meeting and what we mean when we say what must there be notice of and what must be open to the public is that a meeting is uh, the definition from the St. Mary's County Open Meetings Act is that a meeting is the convening of a quorum of the membership to deliberate or act upon a matter over which the commissioners of St. Mary's County and by extension a board or commission they empower and create have supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. This does not have to be a physical meeting. This can include phone calls, emails, teleconferences, Zoom meetings. Anytime in some form or fashion a quorum of the public body gets together and then begins to deliberate and act upon things within its official purview, it's a meeting. So if we think the meeting, the email I sent out last week with these materials and the link to the board docs, there were no... Uh, there was only a two, Miss Gleisner, and I think a CC to me. Everybody else was BCC'd. The reason for that was because until I had the opportunity to come here and warn everybody what a reply all on that email could mean, there was a risk that someone would reply all, everybody would see it, and I would have, within my first year of employment, violated the St. Mary's County Open <laughs> Meetings Act, and we just couldn't have that. Uh, it, it happens from time to time. It, just because a majority of us are together or there is a reply all or something doesn't necessarily mean the Open Meetings Act has been violated. It doesn't necessarily mean there are sanctions and penalties and a write-up forthcoming. You still then have to be acting or deliberating or doing something within your official capacity. So if we all happen to just five or six of us meet serendipitously at Old Town Pub after this and we don't talk a thing about the Police Accountability Board, not going to be a problem. If we meet anywhere else, at the Car Hollywood Carnival, at the county fair in September, wherever it might be, that's going to be okay. Just if we do, unplanned, if a majority seems to form or there's the capacity for it, do not talk about business, do not talk about anything official. That what takes that serendipitous, you know, accumulation of a majority and turns it into a quote-unquote official meeting. So be wary of that in our communications with each other, meetups, things we do on that. So, so just to clarify, we are allowed to discuss things in email as long as they're not controlled information or PII? No, no, it's not, well, kind of, sort of, depending on what the definition there was. You can't discuss in email anything that is related to the business of the Police Accountability Board. So that could be everything from, hey, what do we think of this new policy the sheriff's putting out, to do we really think it's wise to meet next Wednesday or not? Anything that has to do with the official business, not just, you know, the material or anything that touches so upon. So all sausage making needs to be done here. Right. And that's going to make some long meetings. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> we, we do our best to try and keep it reasonable. But um, the short of it is, is always err on the side of caution on this one. And if okay. you do have an email or do have a question, it example it's weird and you can't do this too too much but for example going back to a prior example mr van kirk wanted something added to the agenda um the scenario i gave out was that he could either contact mr cromwell directly which again it's only two people we're not near a meeting 
getting there a little bit worrisome. Yeah, I, I, I don't like it, but it's fine. It'll be okay. But I said the other way you could do about it was just contact me. I then act as the intermediary to go to Mr. Cromwell. And then we make sure, you know, there's no meeting of the body. It's just all administrative staff handling things. That either example there would be okay. The one thing that absolutely could not be done would be Mr. Van Kirk emailing all saying, hey, I think it would be a good idea to talk about this at our next meeting. That email then would become a meeting and unless we gave the public 48 hours heads up, we were gonna be sending that email, it's a violation. John, can I just point out just to them about the minutes? Mm -hmm. Since the PAB only meets quarterly, um, you are allowed to approve your minutes as a body through email. That's how we do it with the Ethics Commission because we only meet quarterly. So I would send the minutes out. I would say, does anybody have any changes, any, any changes or do you all approve it? And once I get the majority of those back approved, that way your vote can count and then those minutes can then be um, sent out and put on the public website. But that's okay. the only time that you can do it is, is because you're only meeting quarterly. ACC wouldn't be the same because they meet monthly so they can always approve them at the next meeting. But if you meet quarterly, you are allowed to approve e minutes through email. So since, since the ACC is uh, the only ones gonna be here in actual cases, and out of 95 incidents, only a handful of them actually have active cases on them in investigative wise. Would there always be a reason to have the ACC meet? No, but yes, because by law, the ACC is required to meet and convene monthly, even if there is no pertinent business to take up. We are at least going to have to have three people show up here, form a quorum, open it up, say that there are no pending reports, close it down. We are out of here in 10 minutes, but it's got to be done. Okay. I, Freely catch me after you know I'm off the clock and I will share my candid thoughts about the propriety of that. But it is what it is, and there's no way around it. Okay. So even when there isn't, you know, real substantive work to be done, at least the meeting has to be held, convened, and then closed out in the ordinary course of business. John, might it be for them to be able to change the time to make it earlier so it doesn't impact their evening so much? That is. Well, if it would that, be helpful, probably be done. Maybe to have it at. at I, I six think that that's one of our orders of business to do tonight, right? To discuss their uh, regular scheduled meetings. Right, but I was talking about the time because. Time would be part of the I mean, okay. the discussion just... for a day, right? We can do that, and um, we can save that more for the end. We are on the schedules because there is, there is some good to consider keeping it at six thirty, just because we can touch on that later, but. Yeah, that, uh, Diane points out a very good point that there are probably ways we can make this easier when there isn't gonna be a lot of activity for the ACC. Okay, um, so one question about special meetings. Who, who do I contact if we need to have a special meeting and, and what's the process there? That would be staff and that would be us. And if there is the need for a special meeting, it would okay. also very likely- So you, John, or Diane? Either one of us or okay. both of us. I also expect it would be the way these things usually go is more often, I think, staff contacting the chairperson about the need for a special meeting than the other way around. But any questions, always feel free to reach out to me and we could take it from there. Okay. All right. The, um, while we're on open meetings then is to also touch upon, I've talked about this a good bit. I'll just go over it again. Um, are closed meetings. So every meeting must begin as an open meeting. Once you have an open meeting, you can then vote to go into closed session for certain enumerated reasons that are provided in both the county and the state local meetings acts. Not every one of them is going to be implicated and necessary to bring up here. For example, I do not perceive that either of these boards will have to go into closed session to deliberate the acquisition of real property which is one of the reasons you can go into closed session. What it could though is the discussion of personnel matters, which both are the appointments to the administrative charging committee and any trial boards that come up by the PAB. It also, 
and we've got a shifting definition of what personnel matters are there, but it's also the same reason besides the explicit permission to do so in state law that the ACC can avail themselves of when they go into closed session to review an investigation file. The other reason any board can go into closed session is to seek confidential legal advice. Those are the two that I see the Police Accountability Board and the Administrative Charging Committee availing themselves the most of. To go into a closed session require a motion by a member of the board in question to go into closed session. There will then be a need a second. There will be any discussion and a vote. Once they go, the vote to go into closed session occurs, there is going to have to be a statement and a reason given by the chair. And it can be no more than the ACC will now go into closed session <coughs> files. Short, simple, leave it at that. It will go into closed session, conduct their business once everything that is they said they were going into closed session to do is taken care of. They will come out of closed session, re-enter open session of that meeting, and then hopefully carry on any other business that has to be taken up that night. Any questions on that process? All right, and then just, you know, in big bold letters here for my boss were effects of noncompliance with the Open Meetings Act. Go over just to remember what is at stake is that if a member of the public's business is conducted without his ability to be present and see that going on when he would have been able to, that member of the public has the right to seek petition for judicial review of the business that was conducted in closed session. Uh, actions the court can take. If that member of the public's challenge is successful and a court does determine that a business was conducted in closed or inaccessible session that ought to have been in open session with all the due notice requirements thereof, court can, among other things, void the action that was taken in closed session, just get rid of it, undo it, and we start from the beginning. Could also award counsel fees, and depending upon the act and the severity and the you know, malfeasance at play and the willfulness of it all could potentially, potentially seek individual sanctions against a member of the committee. Never seen that happen. It's very unlikely that would happen. It's here basically just to scare folks and remember, please just do not send emails, reply all, unless I say that it's okay. That's, if nothing else, that is the moral of the last <laughs> 10 minutes. Moving on from the Open Meetings Act to St. Mary's County Public, to the Public Information Act, which is closely tied <coughs> to the Open Meetings Act in terms of the public's right to receive information, have an idea of what their government is doing. Maryland Public Information Act is wide ranging, it is expansive, and any, the long and short of it is that a member of the public has almost an unrestricted right to access any publicly generated information unless we can claim a privilege on it. Doesn't matter if the member of the public has anything to do with it or not. If it's public information, anyone from anywhere in the state has got a right to send in the request and get a copy of it. There are privileges that can come onto it, such as, you know, legal advice, not accessible. Most personnel records not accessible except to the uh, member of the personnel question. That is going to be a little dicey and that we're still figuring out exactly what will be redacted from these written opinions of the Administrative Charging Committee or not. But what would be accessible in a Public Information Act request? Obviously the obvious ones, meetings, agendas, everything that's in this book, stuff that was out in the public record. Less obvious, but no less you know, affected by this uh, Public Information Act, emails between members if it's involving county business. So even if it's not an open meeting, but hearkening back to that past example of Mr. Van Kirk's email to Mr. Cromwell about, hey, I think it would be a good idea to put this on the agenda, that entire email chain, even though it's between two people and it's not a meeting, it is still two members of the board acting in official capacity. It is fair game under the Public Information Act request. It can extend to, you know, all written materials, including rough drafts and prior versions of documents that are coming out, photographs that are made, emails, um, other correspondence, if we still do that anymore in an age of email, it's <laughs> not electronic. 
uh, private documents that an agency has read and incorporated into its files. So an aggrieved member of the public comes up here with a complaint and says, I have this, you know, private letter. I've written to all 10 of you my woes with the police, and I want you to see it, and only you to see it can't fly. It would be public the moment he turns it over, and you all make it part of your record. Uh, also, salary and compensation records for all government employees or members of public boards and commissions, but not records of an individual's finances, which will be pertinent when we talk about the financial disclosure form later on. It can also include telephone slips, notes, stuff like that, call logs, anything that's pretty much generated by taxpayer dollars or in connection with a taxpayer-funded activity that is either happening at the behest or under the auspices of government can be covered by the, M the Public Information Act. The way to basically think about this is that the one rule to follow is that if you write it or say it or do anything that is any more involved than think it to yourself, odds are you have just got to expect and be prepared for the fact that it could be the subject of a public information request and would be fair game to turn over unless we can claim again one of those isolated privileges for why it shouldn't be turned over in an information act request. Okay, uh, on that, so like these notes that some of us are taking. <laughs> yep, accessible. All right. Uh -huh. So what that doesn't mean, what we're not going to do is I'm not going to at the end of every meeting people turn over the notes, stuff like that, they're yours. At the end of the day, I can only turn over what I physically have custody and control and possession over. And if they don't exist, they don't exist. Is it possible that someday I could get something written up saying we should have had better collection efforts made or as a result of that? Yes. But, well, perhaps. Uh, the yes was coming to the thought where that if the notes or, um, you know, whatever else might you all might be privately generating. If it's something you've relied upon to come to a decision or is informing your actions one way or the other on the record, it is probably best to find some way, even re forgetting the Information Act request, but just thinking about having a record and being able to defend and justify that record if ever some action is challenged in court, best to find that in a record. <coughs> So if you do have notes or you're saying, well, for example, let's um, imagine a scenario where we are talking about appointments and say that you've had a private interaction with an applicant that leads you to a certain way and that is informing your decision, best to just come out and say that. Now, depending, you all might choose to do that in open or closed sessions, obviously, is uh, open session. But you want to have things be part of the official record as much as possible, would be my recommendation on that one. But yeah, you are generating it at a meeting. It's concerning our public business. That technically would be covered by the Public Information Act. Any other questions? Okay. Moving on then to the Public Ethics Ordinance. Uh, St. Mary's County Public Ethics Ordinance. This is found in Chapter 158 of our local municipal code. I've also included the entirety of it. Thank you. That obvious I was suffering? No, oh, not yet. <laughs> I've included the entirety of the um, ethics ordinance here again for your perusal. The overarching purpose of the ordinance is the, ma is the maintenance of impartiality and independent judgment by county officials and employees. Thank you. Thank you. And to understand the purpose of the ordinance, uh, to understand the purpose of the ordinance is the best way to understand the issues the ordinance is intended to address, especially conflicts of interest and how such a conflict can arise. Uh, again, the St. Mary's County Public Ethics must at all times be in compliance with and is restrictive as the Maryland Public Ethics Ordinance. And there are three components to the ethics ordinance, financial disclosure, conflicts of interest, and lobbying. Uh, each elected official is required to prepare and file by April 30th of each year and within 30 days after leaving office, a financial disclosure on a prescribed form. Uh, Ms. Gleisner tomorrow is going to be emailing out that financial disclosure form for you all to fill out and then return to our office in as timely a manner as possible. 
Uh, the statement is going to cover the preceding calendar year, and these statements, as said earlier, are not available for public inspection. They're there to be able to identify conflicts of interest, and that's it. They are not going to be subject to an Information Act request. Statement will ask about, among other things, real estate, business interests, gifts, and debts. It does not ask about values of assets or amounts of indebtedness, bank accounts, or other assets of a board member. And the statement does not contain information sufficient to determine a board member's net worth. Uh, likewise, any person who lobbies a board official or employee or member supporting staff must file a statement by April 15th of each year itemizing any gifts, including but not limited to meals, tickets, or admission passes, awards, or honoraria provided to board members or employees during the preceding calendar year. The recipient must be identified by name and title. Now, I expect... I do not think we are going to see a lot of concerted lobbying here, but if someone comes up to you and says, hey, whatever possible thing the Police Accountability Board might be deciding on, that I have some passing interest here, let me just treat you to dinner or something, just let us know so we can make sure that any legal requirements required by this are being complied with. Um, I have not had to deal with it yet. I'll cross my fingers and say that I don't think we have a single registered lobbyist registered within St. Mary's County government. I hope the day never comes, but we'll see. Then as far as moving on to conflicts of interest, the ordinance prohibits participation in any matter in which a board member, the immediate family of a board member, or a business entity having a connection with the board member or a creditor of the board member has an interest or is a party in, or outside employment or having a financial interest by or in an entity that is regulated by does biz or does business with this uh, the county or that impairs the impartiality or independence of judgment of this board also included is solicitation or acceptance of a gift from any person or entity that does business or will appear before this board or the administrative charging committee and has an interest that may be, quote, substantially and materially affected, unquote, by the performance or non-performance of the board member's duties. There are exceptions for trivial and de minimis gifts. A best, if you come into that situation and have a question, shoot me an email, a phone call, or a text message, and we can make the call. Again, I have not had to deal or have this part of the ethics ordinance be implicated yet. Uh, given the nature and the duties and the powers of the Police Accountability Board and the Administrative Charging Committee, it seems unlikely a lot of these are going to be implicated. But they're here, and they are obviously a matter and are determinative if ever they do apply in this situation. Finally, board members are also forbidden from use of the prestige of their office or confidential information for anyone's financial interest, not their own, not just their own, but anyone's financial interest. And within two years of leaving office, a board member is prohibited from acting as a paid representative in a matter in which the board member, quote unquote, participated substantially. Uh, as a practical matter, even if there is not something that is directly prohibited or is borderline, whether it's covered by the ethics ordinance, the appearance of impropriety can be as problematic as, in, as the actual impropriety itself in terms of what it would cost the public's trust in this board and our ability to carry on our duties with a minimum of controversy or uh, susceptibility to accusations of conflict or loss of public faith and credit. St. Mary's County Public Ethics Ordinance is administered by the St. Mary's County Ethics Commission. The commission is charged with interpreting the ordinance and shall issue opinions advising persons subject to the ordinance. The commission is empowered to exempt specific items from the definition of gift, uh, where the gift is personal and private in nature and not detrimental to the conduct of the board's business. The Ethics Commission is also empowered and directed to conduct proceedings upon receipt of a sworn complaint. Information that may identify the person who is the subject of an advisory opinion is deleted to the fullest extent possible, and complaint proceedings are confidential unless and until a violation is found. Members of the Ethics Commission are appointed by the Commissioner of St. Mary's County for terms of three years. Outside counsel, 
counsel, not my office, acts as legal advisor to the Ethics Commission. The sensitive nature of the business of the Ethics Commission requires sound judgment and discretion and makes appointments to the commission among the most important that the board will make during its term. Again, in summary, the clear message on the ethics ordinance is the takeaway from this one is if it's something that is uncomfortable, if it's something that raises a question, if it's something that raises a suspicion in your head, um, contact our office or go directly to requesting an advisory opinion from the Ethics Commission. And if, if probably, if you come to my office and it is a matter that's does look like it has something to it or we haven't seen before and it is a fair question, we would probably just as likely direct you to seek an advisory opinion from the Ethics Commission as well. That's who is charged with adjudicating these matters. There are also conflicts of interest governed specifically to co um, the ACC in Comar. Um, they don't differ all that much, and you can find that in Comar 12.04.09, number nine on the table of context, contents. They don't uh, differ all that much from what I think you or I would think are common sense definitions of conflicts of interest or the one I just read you from our ethics ordinance. They do go into it with some detail and a little more precision about a police, specifically what an ACC hearing looks like. The one extra requirement that the ACC members have that is not in our ethics ordinance but is in the Comar regulation is that members of the administrative charging committee have an ongoing duty to report adverse events in their personal life to the administrative charging committee chairman. Adverse events are described as they don't give an exhaustive list. The kind of catch-all for it is anything that could cause a loss of the public's trust and your ability to act as a fair, impartial um, arbiter of good moral character in administrative charge committee proceeding. The examples the ACC gives, although it explicitly says they are not limited to this, are being charged with a criminal case, convicted of a criminal violation, things like that, so that result in, uh, you know, fair questions from the public of whether it is in the better part of propriety for someone like that to continue serving on the administrative charge committee. That being said, the only people who make determinations on whether a conflict of interest or an adverse event is dis, uh, pardon me, an adverse event is disqualifying to a member's continued service on the administrative charging committee is again whoever appointed that officer. The police, the county commissioners for the three members they appointed and this the police accountability board for the two members it will appoint. Any questions on the ethics ordinance, conflicts of interest, or adverse events? All right, we're getting there. We're finishing there. We are down now to number 16 on the table of contents. Um, by draft bylaws of the St. Mary's County Police Accountability Board. Um, before we go into that one, I will say that the bylaws are not to be confused with the rules of order. Rules of order are, there are going to be two different rules of order that apply depending on which board or charging committee you're on. The Police Accountability Board uh, is going to use the simplified rules of procedure that the county commissioners implement for all of its boards and commissions. Uh, there's a copy of these in the, I believe I put a copy of these. 14. Yep, 14 for your um, board meeting. These are simplified. They are based, they have their genesis and many things that are common to Robert's rules, but allows for a simplified, not overly formal, not overly stuffy or parliamentary way of conducting business. Simple motions will go, chairperson holds the meetings, um, at the end of the day, the overarching, you know, spirit of these simplified rules are that so long as it's clear that a majority of the board feels a certain way, that is the way it should go. No resorting to parliamentary tactics to defeat a board if a majority wants to revisit a past motion, amend a motion, whatever the case might be. Usually, as long as there is clear discussion on the topic and that consensus emerges, that is the outcome that these rules of procedure point towards. And it also gives the chairperson freedom to apply these rules with as much laxity or severity as the situation might entail in his best judgment. 
It is not the case for the Administrative Charging Committee. We wanted it to be the case for the Administrative Charging Committee. We wanted something sorely other than what we got for the Administrative Charging Committee, but Comar came down and said the Administrative Charging Committee must abide by Robert's rules of order in conducting its business. With all the formalities and formulaic recitations of motions and parliamentary procedure involved thereof. It is what it is. I don't have, we don't have any latitude on getting way around that one for the Administrative Charging Committee because it is right there in Gomar. The bylaws, though, are separate from the rules of order. The bylaws are, again, the regulations and the way of doing business that this board adopts for itself. I provided you a draft set of bylaws. It's um, based upon the template bylaws that usually we apply with some variations to each of the boards and county commissions that the St. Mary's County has. It's nothing too involved, it's nothing too, too, in my opinion, cumbersome or uh, difficult or involved. The only real variations it required from the standard templates are some language added for the fact the chairperson shall be appointed by the St. Mary's County Commissioners, and then adding in some language at the very end calling for the uh, appointment of members of the Administrative Charging Committee only after 30 days of advertising that position, and then how to handle complaints of misconduct, and as well, and training and orientation that this board might want to uh, require of itself or of its members in the future. And look them over, you've had them. I, I, I put on the agenda to adopt bylaws tonight. If it's the consensus of the board that we need more time or it would like more time to look these over, doesn't have to be done today by any measure, but if we're comfortable with going forward with them today and adopting them, we could entertain that motion and be done with it tonight. But this would be a point where I would open it up to discussion from members of the board, what they think of the bylaws, if there are any fixes, tweaks, additions, subtractions, they would consider necessary or prudential. At this point, I only have a couple of administrative comments on the bylaws. Anybody else get a chance to review? I did get a chance to review. It seemed acceptable to me, but I'd like to hear your clarifications. Well, administratively on the ACC bylaws, functions of the body, it seems to have been cut off at the very end. Mm -hmm. oh. Pardon, you are correct. I can fix that clerical error. The um, ACC's bylaws, because we don't have a quorum for the ACC, can't be adopted tonight anyways. Okay. I, I will disseminate the correct draft of that tomorrow by email. Actually, the only, only other item I have would be under the uh, quorum section. Since we're going forward with a nine person body under the PAB, would it be wise to spell out what a quorum is of five people? Or do we leave that open in case the number of personnel changes on within the body? I'm trying to find where in quorum I had on. Page five, section seven. Got it. Reason I left it as majority of the members is so we could say a five member board, uh, five members required right now. The issue in thinking about the composition of this board and future boards is that the resolution as written is that membership of the PAB can be a minimum of five and up to nine members. The reason I thought to leave it as a majority is that it's going to mean we don't have to amend the bylaws if ever in the future. Exactly what, yeah, that's exactly what I was just saying. Do we want to leave it to that so we don't have to modify them in the future if the, quant if the number of the body changes? Your quorums Thoughts? are always going to be 50% plus one. That's how we, we describe them in our training. Right. So. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with leaving it the way it is for simplicity reasons. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to see how everybody else thinks about that. No discussions? I'm good with as they are myself. Say again? I'm good with as they are Okay. myself. It's like, like Ms. Gleisner said, it's, it's always... You know, just because if, if a board member quits, our board was set at nine for right now, so I would assume we still have to have five until another one was appointed. 
Right. And unless the commissioners decided to change and say, we don't want nine anymore, we only want seven, or then it would change to four. Right. I'm assuming that's how it would it would work. We're based upon nine right now, so I think we would always work up upon the number nine unless we got clarification from you know staff. No, in that specific example, again, the language I hear would be that it's a majority, and so if we did, you know, someone got scared off tonight. We were down to an eight-member board. Four is not a majority of um, no. eight. It's 50. We would need 0.1% more, so we would still need a five-member board in that case. Imagine, though, that we had two people go down. Then we could then have a quorum of four uh, if we were down to, say, a seven-member board and would not need a revision to the bylaws if we kept the language as is. Yep. John, did the county commissioners uh, provide an extra person non-voting until there's a vacancy? No, there is no designated substitute or alternate for the Police Accountability Board. Okay, thank you. With regard to the uh, Article Three, the functions of the body, and uh, I guess my, my question concerns mainly number three, community perceptions of law enforcement in St. Mary's County and number five, ways of fostering better community relations with local law enforcement. Could, could you explain how that function would evolve out of this, uh, out of the Police Accountability Board? I, I don't think that it would require quantifiable, easily identifiable, you know, hard line metrics to determine whether or not we're meeting those two functions. The idea there was just in fleshing out kind of what sort of activities or duty or, you know, business this board can conduct. So I do think it would be reasonable for um, this board to think about reaching out, talking with the community, and this feeds into, I think, that duty from the statute that it is supposed to meet uh, or regularly advise the county commissioners on ways to improve matters of policing and local law enforcement. The idea was that there should probably, that there needs to, should be some solicitation of input from the community. Exactly how the board would decide to do that is up to the board. It could be, I don't know, saying that we have the PAB at stmarysmd.com email. Please send in any comments, thoughts. We'll look at them all, add them into the record. It could be holding a public forum. It could be inviting community organizations to come out here and give a presentation to the board, whatever you all decide to do it. So I don't I don't think if it answers the question that those two duties give you any specific obligations in terms of actual definable activities that you have to do, but it's just pointing out that this board does contemplate and takes it within their power and it's their desire to find ways to solicit that public input to inform the advice that they will eventually be offering up to the county commissioners. discussion um, uh, we just have one more administrative <laughs> under article 10 complaints of misconduct third line from the bottom upon receipt of a complaint containing all required information we need to insert a comma and say the complaint shall be forwarded all right And my name is misspelled on the last page. <laughs> oh, I apologize for that. <laughs> That's all right. Everybody does it. It's I the am common, in trouble for that it's one. It's the common spelling. It, it happens daily. I, I would like to sit there and just, you know, say autocorrect, but I avail myself of that particular <laughs> excuse, too. Anybody else have any comments? I, I think, honestly, until we get into this, we won't have a lot to... To, to modify our bylaws. I think once we get into it and determine what our processes are and find where the holes and flaws are, uh, we may have some, 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 you know, some meat to add to the bylaws at that point. Uh, the other thing I will say is again, harkening back to comments earlier in the night, uh, this process, this experiment is being conducted in real time all across the state. We are gonna see some ideas from other counties that we're gonna wanna pick up. And so with that, I, Article 12 amendments, it's 
intentionally an extremely simple process to amend these bylaws. It's just at any time may be amended by a majority vote of the body. Nothing more complex, nothing more involved than that. Know that you know it has to be proposed for a month ahead of time. It has to go through three readings ratified by three-fourths of the election districts in St. Mary's County. It is as simple as I could, as it could possibly be made to give us the nimbleness and the flexibility. Starting point, yeah, yeah. absolutely. To work on this. Um, okay, hearing no other inputs. Then the procedure at this time would be if, um, because we do have some amendments to um, minor, but we'll still take them into account. If someone would like to make a motion that the board adopt the proposed bylaws with the amendments discussed by Chairperson Cromwell. If someone would make that motion, then we would get a second. I'll make oh, a motion. Yep. A second. Yep. All right, we have a motion uh, made in. by Mr. Kaufman, seconded by Ms. Allen. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Is that unanimous, everybody? I have it. I think so. Yeah. You've got bylaws. One of the provisions of that bylaw was the creation of a office of vice chair for the Police Accountability Board. The idea being that probably not always going to be a case where our chair can be present, though I'm sure not, uh, not by his wishes or his design, but it'll happen from time to time. The idea just to have a designated person to stand in on those days where for whatever reason the chair can't be present. Um, Y'all could nominate or have the discussion of the election of a vice chairperson among yourselves right now. That ability is there. If it's something that you all would like to take more time on and come to at a later date, also would be appropriate. It's whatever the board feels comfortable with at this moment in time. What's the uh, consensus? Do we want to determine this tonight or chew on it for a month or so? I would think we could determine. I mean, it's a pretty, it's only four meetings for the year, so <laughs> chances are you're missing one is pretty rare, but it could happen. But if, if anybody would, lo I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with, with that myself. Um, someone has a interest in it. Yeah, I was gonna say, anybody have an interest in becoming vice chair? Frank? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll take it if nobody has an has an has an interest. You know, I okay. would certainly volunteer. But. All right, then. If no other volunteers, someone wants it is election season. The um, motion to be right now would be for someone to nominate Mr. Van Kirk uh, to serve as vice chair. Someone would second that. And uh, vote so I'll, I'll make the motion to uh, Mr. Van Kirk uh, be the vice chair. I'll second it. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All oh, right. Carried. As I said before, we won't be able to take care of election of the administrative charging committee chairpersons or setting their schedule tonight because we do not have quorum. That will happen at their next scheduled meeting on the 17th, hopefully. Uh, the last thing to do is for, well, two remaining items of business. The next one are the adoption of the meeting schedules. And if you'll turn to the last pages in the orientation meeting, uh, number 18 and number 19. You've got the meeting schedule of the Police Accountability Board and the Administrative Charging Committee. Police Accountability Board is required by law to meet at least four times a year. And I am just going to go ahead and, well, I interpreted that as even though we are only meeting uh, the second half of 2022, we could still try and get in uh, four meetings. I think that's a prudential decision as well, owing to we are gonna be kind of learning as we go on this one and there are some housekeeping matters to take up. I'm also thinking about it, we are under a deadline still to get that report generated by December 31st and that's going to catch up on us sooner than we would think. So some time will have to be given to what we want that report to look like and how the board will solicit the information that is going to go into that report. Uh, presentations from the Sheriff's Department, community meetings, survey, these are things to be decided on and put out there probably sooner rather than later so that we can then begin drafting a report and hopefully have it in a position where we can adopt and publish that report to the commissioners sometimes between Thanksgiving and Christmas. 
So the meeting schedule we have here, it would be Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We've gone ahead and just, it's not binding, but have reserved this room for these dates and those times to make sure we have it. So John, you said you had some insight on why it would be 6.30 would be better? 6.30 would be better just because this room is in use. People do work. All our boards usually meet. 6.30 is the pretty Anytime something has happened that the public meeting gets into, usually at 6.30. Uh, most of our boards, our public forums are due it. Both usually that is what's usually easiest on the members themselves. Most work and um, have obligations from 8 to 5 in the day. It's also the more accessible time for members of the public if they want to come because they also certainly have members from 8 to 5. Uh, I'm thinking if it... It comes down to it. The administrative charge committee, there's really not going to be a whole lot of public involvement in those proceedings. Those are the days where, one, you're probably going to want to make sure the savage room is available. That is used during the day, so we're still probably talking evenings if we perceive a need to go into closed session. But if we've got a meeting of the administrative charging committee that is just going to, you know, ring the bell, state that we have nothing approve minutes from the last meeting, close the meeting out, or join it till the next session. Those are things that don't have to be done in 6.30 where people can be with their families. Folks can come here during lunch, whatever, we can work it out. But we could also set the meetings for right now to 6.30 to have it. So if we do have one of those meetings coming up where it's, we're gonna be here for however long it takes to review one of those files, better to 6.30 and on or the evening on is pretty much only when we're gonna have the guaranteed access to that conference room. So before we even entertain any other times, are there any openings on Wednesdays before 1830? So we can check. I will, um, what we could do at least, we could adopt a schedule right now, go with it. I know all these dates and times are taking. We could probably, you know, 30 days out, we'll have an idea of whether or not we're gonna have something that month, get into a, um, meeting and we could probably change the time ahead of time and still talk about per per meeting per meeting change yeah, the time ahead of time I if would think we need so, to, or we want to. sorry if you adopt that schedule and you try to change the time of that meeting that's going to say a special meeting because you're you're deviating from that schedule Got it. I'm just trying to let you know but I do know the schedule that I made up it's this room should be free from 5 p.m. onward because Wednesdays, this was, the reason they were Wednesdays is these were like the only nights we had available because there's so many boards and commissions that meet in here. Right. The limited schedule, and, and meeting this late in the year, everything's set, like Janu so January of next year, maybe if you wanted a different day, we could look at that before <coughs> this whole meeting schedule set. But like Planning Commission has Mondays and Board of Appeals has Thursdays, so there's set dates and times for meetings, so that's why they're kind of spread out. They're not like every two weeks or every, you know, just, just when I could get the meeting room. But the time could change, but we'd have to adopt that <coughs> today. Okay. Before we consternate too much, is there a desire to to change it other, other than 6.30 p.m. on Wednesdays? Wow. The only hesitation I would have is like uh, Mr. Hauser said, and I don't know how much public input we would have on our um, agendas, you know, boards, I know you have to open it up to the public since it's a public meeting. I'm not sure how much we have, but if you did it at five o'clock, I don't know if somebody could file a complaint saying, hey, you know, I wasn't even home at five o'clock to try to get home, get straight, get to the meeting. So I'm just, um, yeah, I know other I agree boards, with you. That's why I they think meet five would be too early. Yeah. Uh, but, but I do believe since we only meet quarterly, that our meetings could possibly be quite lengthy. Um, maybe a little earlier, like 6 p.m. would do, so we're not getting home at nine o'clock at night. <laughs> um, but that would be my only suggestion. And is there any other input on this before? The only, only suggestion I was make as a brand new committee and trying to invite as much of the public as possible, trying to be consistently at the same time, each time 6.30, sets a nice pace and tone for reliability and consistency. Uh, I think you're gonna find that there's gonna be a lot less to do uh, until this new committee gets 
well publicized and, and, the, and the machine starts to get the wheels turning, it's, it's gonna be slow. I don't think you're gonna have to worry about, it, especially with the ACC. I think you're gonna have a lot of uh, uh, less time than you may think in the beginning. Yeah, maybe. So, Clay, um, are there any cases in the process right now that the ACC is gonna have to hear? So today we, we uh, received our first uh, complaint that would fit the criteria for the ACC. Okay. That came in today. But that's still under investigation. So Just started the ACC today. Won't, won't see that for quite, quite 20 those, years. Those investigations really vary upon the circumstances and how long it takes to complete an investigation. But like Mr. Hauser already said, by statute, it's a year and a day from when the complaint's received. It has to be completed or gone through the whole process, actually. Right. right. And there are a few more dates and timelines. Once the... Um once the ACC receives that complaint, it has to meet within 30 days, or not the complaint, receives the completed investigation of the File. complaint. The ACC at least has to meet to initially <clears throat> review that complaint within 30 days of the complaint coming in. So it's still, as long as you keep a schedule of monthly meetings, you're always going to hit that ability. And then, at least in the initial meeting, all the ACC has to make at that time is the ability to review the file and determine whether it can make a determination as is, or if it's gonna require additional investigation of that file. So that, that ought to be done on a meet once a month schedule. Like I said, if going harkening back to the special meetings, if it, again, not expecting it, but just imagine the possibility that there's a time where we just get slammed with complaints. Rather than sit here and try and do five complaints and be here until 1 a.m. in the morning, at that point, better part of Valor is just call a special meeting or two and break these up in a time that's reasonable. And that absolutely would be within the abilities of the ACC to do. Sure. And my suggestion was particularly geared towards the PAB because that's the citizen's involvement point and really was not a suggestion as far as the timeline on the ACC, but more so on anything dealing with the public. Yeah, agreed. I would not be in favor of changing it all the time. We need to have a set schedule and stick to it if we can. Um, so any other discussion on that or are we ready to make a motion? So I will one change that I would recommend to the Police Accountability Board's schedule is that this next meeting uh, was recommended to be August 3rd. Now, there might be reasons to keep it at August 3rd, but that is going to be before the 30 days runs for the invitation for applications to the ACC. So my suggestion would be, um, and I think meet August 3rd if we think there is a business we could take up and want to, but... And I could think, you know, talking about how we want to deal with these applications, how we're going to possibly how, maybe. How long does it take once we determine that we're going to go out for public appointments or, or applications? How long does that process take before it, our 30-day counter starts? Yep. So the last act of business tonight is there's going to be a motion for the board to publicly invite applications to these two remaining vacancies and direct the staff to issue a press release. Uh, that's going to be done tomorrow morning. So there is a, okay. so the 30 days will begin rolling tomorrow. There is an administrative charging committee meeting already on the books for August 17th. So we know we've got the room available at 6.30 p.m. on the 17th. That'll be after our 30 days. My thought was to rather than have the PAB meet on August 3rd, have the PAB meet on August 17th and we just do another joint meeting. And maybe at the end of that meeting, well, we wouldn't be able to seat the, uh, ACC by then because we'd have to you know, reach out to whoever gets the nomination, get them on it. They're probably still looking at the next meeting after that. So just a while you would be excused from that meeting. But the PAB could meet on the 17th, then possibly appoint its two members. And then we've got a fully staffed ACC ready to meet. Um, I take it back. We could still have a joint meeting because we would have a quorum on the 17th with Dr. Limas being back. So the ACC, if they wanted to, without the presence of those two additional members, elect a chairperson from among themselves and adopt bylaws, in theory. So we're now, after we're done with the PAB business, we can roll right into the ACC stuff? Right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm in favor of that. So uh, motion to move our next meeting to the 17th uh, to allow for our 30 day public request for I'll applications. Second that, second that motion, 6.30. 6.30, yep. 
And Mr. Cromwell, if we could also, if I could beseech you to amend or implore upon you to amend that motion to include and also schedule meetings of the Police Accountability Board on Wednesday, November 9th and Wednesday, December 7th. Yes. Or, or just to adopt the um, proposed meeting schedule with the change of August 3rd to August yeah. 7th. We'll add to the motion to adopt the remaining two uh, PAB meeting suggestions there for November 9th and December 7th at also 1830. Is that a, still a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 I think that's unanimous. Second did that. I was trying to... Right. Uh, Mr. Tom. Um, Thank you. Last act of business. We could have a motion inviting public applications for the two appointments to be made on the, well, a little bit of discussion on this one first. Um, is the board comfortable with asking members to in apply through the county's applications portal using the same process that uh, you applied for the board through? Any discussion? No, I'm comfortable. Uh, it works for me. I think it'd be fine. Uh, yep. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel there. So and then are I, we also, um, would the board also like to require the same background checks that were required of your applications? Yeah, yeah. if they're going to be sitting yes. members of the ACC, absolutely. Okay. Then, um, the, app, then the motion would be to um, move that the Police Accountability Board invite applications from the public for the two uh, appointments to the Administrative Charging Committee and to direct staff to release a press release advertising um, this motion and collecting applications on the board's behalf. And I think a simple um, I'll make that motion would work. I'll second it. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Who was first? <laughs> was that you, Frank? I think so. <laughs> Frank was second. All right. All in, All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. All right. That is all the scheduled business, all the mandatory fun that I had on the agenda for tonight. If there is any new business, if there is any discussion from um, members of the board, now would be a time to hear it. If there is not, uh, anybody may feel free to make a motion to adjourn. I have one question. The uh, You and I had discussed before the training. Yeah. If we heard anything about how they're going to do that and when they're going to do that, and so, I would make the recommendation, I know the ACC has to do it, mm -hmm. but I would recommend if anybody else that would want to do it, we need to go through it also. So there was talk, and it was, again, one of the more controversial and exactly what does the state mean by this requirement. So there was an expectation the year that the state was going to require mandatory training for any member of the Police Accountability Board and Administrative Charging Committee. We never got elaboration on what that was until on the 28th when the regulations um, did come down. There is not going to be any mandatory state training of members of the Police Accountability Board. The Administrative Charging Committee is going to have required training. The final, uh, at least the last time I checked last week, there still wasn't final uh, training related. What they were talking about is that the Maryland Police Standards and Training Commission was going to administer one day of training in each county. So they were going to come to us individually. Don't know exactly what the topic of the training will be or what it's going to cover. Uh, it will be required. Uh, my expectation is in the conversation with them is that those will be open to the public. So a member of the Police Accountability Board could come. I'm also hoping that if we can implore upon them to do it at a regular meeting of the Administrative Charging Committee, we do that in open session. It's televised. Any going watch it on YouTube afterwards. But once I know what that training is and what's going to be required of it, I will communicate that to you all, whether it's going to be open to members of the PAB or not. Well, I would move that any member of the PAB desiring to sit on the ACC attend that in advance. I mean, what do we do? How many times... Are these two appointments that we're going to be pointing, is it going to be for the entire year or is it per case? So it's going to be, it's going to be for the entire year. Entire so year. it's going to be okay. for the entire term. Um, that's it. And again, the only time they are going to come off of that is they will serve to the expiration of that term or 
the languages that they serve at the pleasure of the appointing body until they're removed by the Police Accountability Board by majority vote. Other than that, they will be in there until the expiration of the term. And it is a requirement at Comar that nobody can participate in administrative charging committee review until they have received that hearing, uh, training. So one way or the other, um, they will have to go through that training, whether here or at another county or whatever the Maryland Police Standards and Training Commission will give them credit for, but it's got to be done by any member of the ACC. And the ACC is the one that has the non-voting standby member also, right? That's the Police Accountability Board. The ACC consists only of those five um, voting members. Okay. <clears throat> John, I have a question. If the what is the procedure if you have to miss? I know August the seventeenth, I will be out of town um, that week. So, what is the procedure if we have to miss a meeting? So, excused absences are fine. We um, there is the expectation in the bylaws of how many, I believe it's in there, uh, unexcused absences there ought to be. Obviously, you know, you're here. Fortunate, I um, there won't be a way on. I'm thinking through, we are reevaluating the county and readjusting. We used to have many options for going by virtual and doing by Zoom. Okay. I am thinking, would it be possible for you to, if you're out of the county, come in via Zoom? Yes, that would be possible. And I would say, um, again, as long as no other member of the board has a problem with that, you would, it would be fine for you to okay. participate in the proceeding by Zoom. <laughs> Is that an option for anybody at any time? For members of the board, yes. We've been getting increasingly cagey about members of the public doing that. For example, we had a public forum last night. There were no, um, previously as a COVID measure, we used to allow the option to call in comments to the forum. That's been disallowed. Ultimately, it's gonna be up to the board to decide in what manner you seek public comment. Uh, but by and large, again, when it's for cause and as long as the non-in-person -per means are not going to be detract or aren't unreliable. For example, we had a Board of Appeals meeting the other night where we spent 25 minutes trying to get the guy's internet connection to work. And <laughs> believe it or not, the attorneys were just not comfortable with the scenario. We were holding up a compute, his telephone to a computer so he could hear and waiting for him to respond <sighs> to the computer. and. <laughs> if it gets to something like that, we ain't doing it. But if you've got a standard, yeah, no, I, I was talking about community. board members. <laughs> as long as it, um, I would say that again. As long as the board is okay with it, and as long as it's a reliable means of communication, should be fine. And we've been fairly permissive of that with boards. And Nick, Thank your you. suggestion is well founded. You know, we have a lot to cover, and waiting for the state to make decisions about training and everything else. That's a great suggestion about it. anybody who's interested from the PAB to go over to the ACC to really plan on attending whatever training is available. Yeah. I know I'd like to do that. I agree. I mean, that's that's anybody who thinks they may want to, needs to. And once I have more information, I am, um, Wayne Silver is the gentleman at MPSTC that I'm in contact with. I will take his temperature tomorrow morning and figure out where they're at in the process, if there has been anything more definite that's come down. I know they have not set a date to come down here, but other than that. I think, I think the um, bylaws said for absences, contact the county administrator or myself. Um, I'm good with either. And I can provide my contact information. Um, Will we get a telephone tree list of all the members? Yeah, members? that's something I was going to ask about. No. Even though we can't email everybody, okay. we do need to be able to contact individuals. Yeah. That's, that's your call. Uh, that's I've always been told no. Um, let me go in. If they're being told, I personally... Mm -hmm. well, I have warned you and admonished I mean, you sufficiently, in my opinion, that if it happens... Probably up to us, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we want to, our, the board to have it, then we can let them have it, right? And I understand that. I'm not arguing with you, but the Open Meetings Act, that's a suggestion. Oh. So that's, that's the reason I'm saying that. It's uh, because of the Open so Meetings Act. Like my Ethics Commission, everything goes through me, and then I go to them. If there's like information that has to go out, they send it to me, and then I send it to them, so that way they're not talking to each other. They're only talking to me. And then I'm talking to them. Because anything we provide has to be Correct. made public. Correct. That's that's why I said the contact list. <laughs> I know it's a it's a sticky wicket, but it's no, just... I, I understand now. I understand why it's a problem. 
Yes. So okay. as far as the attendance during the bylaws, we just adopted, but it says to contact the chairperson. Yeah, it says chairperson says or county administrator, I think, doesn't it? It actually chairperson should oh, notify just chairperson? the okay. county administrator of the absence. John, you can well, suggest oh, our let office me see. because if it's below seven. people are going to be missing, then we have to make sure we have a quorum before we have a meeting. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Because we have to give out. That's, that's my job to, to make that determination, right, as chairman? Well, if you have, but if you don't have a quorum, you have to let us know because we have to send out a special notice canceling that meeting to make sure that the public has enough uh, advance notice. That that's I'm not trying to take over your. No, no, you know, I'm saying so. If, I'm if just we saying, have five absentees, right. we're not going to have a because then you'd have to say, hey, Diane, we can't have a meeting tonight, and a press release has to go out as soon as possible so that we have enough notice. Okay. For the public, so they know that the, these meetings aren't going to take place. Nick, the only thing I'll say is what I do. I'm on a, um, our planning commission. And I've had my hand slapped many times for emailing the wrong, the wrong people. So what I started doing was I just email our chairman and um, who we answer to from that, which is land use and growth management director. I email them to and say, I can't make a meeting or, or that way I'm only talking to one person is not really about any business it's just about the fact that i can't make so you know and so that the governing body of our meetings which is lugum knows and in this case i would probably you know email mr how or you know the county attorney's office and yourself and I, that would be it what i've what i've done on other boards is come up with some generic emails um can the county provide us an email or should i just use some sort of gmail we can do that. We could also set it up, I would think, that just PAB, say PAB chairman at com. We could have Mary's that up, yeah. automatically forwarded to your email. I'm also thinking through this for a second, realized at least for members of the administrative charge committee are going to have to have a direct line to you because the, as it's written in Comar, adverse events get reported to the chairperson. So it is what it is. Um, let me talk this over with the county administrator, my boss, tomorrow. See, I am thinking that if the concern is that the public has contact information, telephone numbers, and emails, I am thinking we could shield that under the uh, aegis of personal of personnel or personal information. I'm not worried about that coming at in a public information act disclosure. Yeah, that's PII information. That public information act should cover that, right? Well, if it's your private communication, that's just for between you. I'm thinking we could shield that. If we got a, say, a public email where it's PAB chairman, obviously that's going to be public knowledge. Sure. Any email on that's going to be fair game. Let me talk it over and I will shoot out another email in the morning. I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of that generic email because okay. even the next chairman, I mean, they could pick right up without changing emails and, and the public knows what that email is going to be and so on and so forth. It, it adds continuity to the whole process. I'll inquire of that with IT tomorrow. We should get a pretty quick response on okay. whether and how feasible that is. And one more uh, question. Do, are we signing NDAs? Okay. Well, it won't be an NDIA. What the requirement is for members, and weirdly, it's a requirement of the Police Accountability Board, but not of the ACC, the way Comar is written. There will be confidentiality agreements that every member of the Police Accountability Board will have to sign, pledging to keep confidential any complaint, et cetera, until it reaches final disposition by the ACC. So that agreement is forthcoming, and I should have that out as soon. Okay. We found out about that June 28th, and it, taking a little bit of hoops. I thought it would have been a normal that. course of action when you're dealing with personal information, so. Yeah. All right, if there is nothing else, we could take a motion to adjourn, a second. Any, a uh, any oh, here. by the ways, any discussions, questions? Hearing none, I move to adjourn. A second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, unanimous. All right, congratulations. See you all on August 17th. <clears throat>